All good. All good? Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm really excited to put, introduce Manish Kumar. Um, we've known each other for a really long time, and I've really <coughs> enjoyed following his work, so I'm incredibly happy that um, he can come here to talk to us today. Um, so Manish got his undergrad in, um, in India, uh, ended up doing a, um, uh, working for a little while, and then doing a PhD um, at University of Illinois. Uh, then went to do a postdoc at the Harvard Medical School, where he switched kind of, you know, he's, he was looking at, did engineering for PhD, switched over to biomedical, and now he does kind of some sort of combination of um, both. So today he's going to be talking about um, artificial water channels um, and how we can apply those to, um, I guess, mostly drinking water treatment. So. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Catherine, uh, for having me here, and thank you everybody else for coming. Uh, so, so my talk today um, is um, very, um, so for environmental engineering, it's a little more sciencey than I like it to be, but that's the kind of work I do, so that's what I'm presenting. Uh, but I'll show you a little bit my, of my background, and you'll see that I come from a solid engineering background. I'm just trying to see what we can do the small scale so we can move up to engineering. So the title of this talk is What Can We Learn From Nature About Designing Membranes? And it's about 13 years of my uh, uh, research packed into this one presentation. It has everything up to two weeks ago. So you're really getting the full tour. You may or may not appreciate it, but I'll try to make it entertaining. So let me start by giving you a little bit of uh, background about where I've been and what I've been doing and why this all comes together in this narrative. So uh, like Catherine said, uh, I came here after doing an a undergraduate in uh, um, chemical engineering uh, from India, from a small uh, school, engineering school in India, and I started a master's in a master's program or a PhD program, but I didn't finish it. I left with a master's. I was not enjoying myself. Uh, so I went and worked in industry for about eight, seven to eight years on, um, uh, on uh, a pilot and full-scale studies of membranes and other water treatment technologies. Uh, this was, uh, membranes were very new at this time, uh, so it was an exciting thing to do for an environmental engineer in the field. Uh, so I worked on that. Uh, but I missed, somehow I started missing graduate school. I, I did not like it the first time, but I realized that the parts that I did like would be more enjoyable if I had things under my control. Right? In graduate school, somebody tells you to do something, you've got to do it. I was, I, I was of the feeling, I, I felt that if I had control over what I could do, I would be much happier. And I was more mature too. So, uh, so I realized that I wanted to be a professor, so I wanted to go back and do something very unique with my PhD. So I worked on this project. Uh, that I had a single line uh, statement of purpose saying, I want to make membranes that look like cell membranes, like biological membranes. That was my uh, uh, hypothesis or whatever to my advisor. And he was like, okay, you're welcome to do it. I don't know anything about it. You figure it out. So, so I, I did that. So I, I, the, the one thing I did during my PhD was to show that you can take proteins out of living cells and put them in polymers and they still work. And I was interested in proteins that transport water because uh, I wanted to treat water. Uh, and I showed uh, that in theory and in practice, it's possible. So that was my PhD work. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and after this, I realized that to actually design these proteins, we need to learn what these proteins look like. So that's why I did a postdoc uh, where we used cryo-electron microscopy to solve the structure of proteins. Uh, so that we know where the pore is and what the pore looks like that transports water so efficiently. So we'll talk a lot more about this today as well. And then I moved, after I finished my postdoc, I moved to Penn State uh, to work on these ideas to make membranes. But one of my students uh, told me that he was tired of working on proteins. Uh, he said, they're never going to work in an environmental system. Who are you kidding? Uh, so we tried to see if we can make <coughs> molecules using synthetic chemistry that look like these proteins so we can do desalination or other water treatment with it. So that's what we did. That's what I did during my time at Penn State. Now I'm at University of Texas. Uh, and my goal is to take ideas from this realm 
and see if we can make something that, are, that is larger scale. So we are on our way to doing this, and today I'm just going to talk about these different ideas that we have picked up along the way and how we are trying to put it together into membranes. Um, still early days, but it's very exciting for me. Um, so this is something that we talk about a lot in my business now. We try to tell people that membranes are becoming really important for many different applications because it's an energy efficient way of doing separations. Uh, and it's a very important for environmental engineering uh, because separations and energy efficient separations are important for air pollution uh, as well as for uh, water remediation. So uh, desalination, water reuse, contaminant removal uh, using reverse osmosis has become a very big part of um, water treatment. Uh, and then in gas separations, capture, CO2 capture and process intensification to make distillation columns smaller is a very big emerging area of research with lots of potential for energy savings. Uh, so, so membranes are important, but membranes have challenges. And this is a, a picture or this is a figure that you'll see to, in every membrane talk you go to these days. So this is called the selectivity trade, uh, permeability selectivity trade-off. What it says is, if you, so for example, if you're separating oxygen from nitrogen, uh, you can have a lot of lo very high permeability for oxygen, but then you won't do very good separations between oxygen and nitrogen. So that's a, a fact of life. You can have very high permeability or very high selectivity. Uh, and this is easier understood for uh, desalination. So you, what do you want to do? You want to remove salt from water, right? Uh, you can have very high permeability for water, orders of magnitude high, uh, higher than the lower ones, but then you won't do very good separations. And this number I want you to remember. If you want to do seawater desalination, you want uh, 10,000 selectivity between water and sodium chloride. So 10,000 water molecules, one salt molecule. You can do seawater desalination. That's a number that people have come up with. But you see there, the permeability is much lower than, than regular membranes that don't do desalination. So this trade-off exists in every membrane that's commercially made right now. And uh, what we want is some, to be somewhere in the top right corner for these things. And that's, a, that's the grand challenge of membranes. Um, we know what we can do to solve this. Because uh, biology solves this, right? And the way it solves it is by having selective membranes with very small and precise pore sizes. And also, all the pores are the same, right? So if your cells have a channel for water, all of them have a 3.2 angstrom pore, all of them, right? When you make a membrane using polymer chemistry, you get pores of a huge size distribution. You get a bell curve, right? Because you let solvent evaporate to make your membrane, or you do some cross-linking process, so it's somewhat of a random process. So you get a random size distribution with some mean, right? So what that does is it leads to this trade-off. Because if you want to shift the distribution to one side, you'll still have some big pores that will allow things to pass through. So it's because of this polydispersity that you get this selectivity permeability trade-off. And our cell membranes don't have this trade-off because we have one pore size for one, uh, one kind of separation. So, so biological uh, membranes seem to be the ideal type of membrane compared to current membranes. And now let me talk about reverse osmosis membranes. Reverse osmosis membranes are membranes that separate salt from water. And they're very unique type of membranes. Uh, they're not just membranes with a hole in them so that water goes through and salt doesn't. Uh, there's something called uh, a solution diffusion membrane. So let me walk you through this. So this is a reverse osmosis membrane. Uh, it's a polyamide, polyamide polymer, 100 nanometer film. And uh, contrary to what you would imagine, it doesn't have holes all the way, going all the way through. It doesn't have holes for water to go through and salt to be excluded. What it does is it allows water to get dissolved into the polymer. And the polymer has these small void volumes, they call them, or free volume elements, where water can get in and diffuse from one void volume to another by the thermal motion of polymers. So it uh, so it dissolves, so that solution, and, and then diffuses from one free volume to another. So it hops from one free volume to another. So then water goes through, kind of in a random way, through the, through the membrane. And then salt has all, this, all these waters around it so it diffuses slower. So that's how you get separations. So the challenge with this is the polymer has to get out of the way for water to hop from one free volume to another. 
So you need thermal motion. So you need an activation energy. So I don't know how many of you guys think about this stuff, but you have to provide some energy for uh, the polymers to move out of the way so the water can get through. So intrinsically, this is a very inefficient looking process, right? Because you get a, a, got all this molecular action happening for water to get through. And water diffusion is random too. It doesn't go only in one direction. It goes every which way before it gets out. So it's a, a little bit of a probabilistic process. If you like a look at biological membranes, first of all, it's a very thin film. It's not 100 nanometers or 200 nanometers. It's 5 nanometers. It's very thin. It also has specific channels. So now we have a hole. And this hole only allows one molecule of water to go through. And it's the size that only allows one water molecule to go through. And everything else is rejected. And there's nothing to move out of the way. So the activation energy to move things out of the way is only 5 kilocalories per mole. So this is almost barrier-less transport. In addition, for proteins like aquaporins, the water channels that transport water in our body, it's single file water transport, and the inside of these proteins are very hydrophobic. So there's no slip, so the water doesn't stick to the wall. So it can go through friction, in a frictionless manner through these channels. So this idea of using channels for desalination and water transport is becoming very popular to at least research in, in our field, uh, using carbon nanotubes, graphene membranes, and what I'm going to talk about today, biomimetic membranes. That's the first part of the talk today. So let's talk about these uh, fascinating water channel proteins. I love talking about these because they're simple and at the same time, not so simple. So what these are, and you must have seen some of these pictures in your biochemistry textbooks, and when, whatever, whenever you did take those classes. So this protein ha is a tetramer. So there are four copies of the same protein that come together in a membrane to make this square-shaped uh, molecule. And this is a space-filling version. So you can see this is the protein, and you can see that pore where water will go through in the middle over there. Uh, and each one of this is made up of these membrane-spanning domains. So this is your lipid bilayer. This is your cell membrane, which does not allow water to go through that fast. And then these, uh, this protein has these membrane-spanning domains. So it has six membrane-spanning domains and two loops that, doesn't, doesn't go all the way, that don't go all the way through the membrane. But when you fold them together, these two loops make an hourglass shape. And this intricate structure is what allows water to go through in a single file. So now, why does it work so well? Uh, it has perfect selectivity for water. So it allows water to go through, no salts, no other molecules, no protons. Doesn't even allow protons to go through, which is amazing. So the person, uh, Peter Agri, that discovered why protons don't go through won the Nobel Prize in 2003 for this work. Um, so the reason it is so selective is because it's only the size of a water molecule. So anything bigger than that cannot go through. Any hydrated ions cannot go through. Um, it has electrostatic repulsion. It has a big charge residue right here that prevents other cations from going through. And the most interesting one is this water dipole reorientation. So water hydrogen bonds to the surface, some surface residues. And if you can see, the water dipole in this direction is all facing one way. And here it's facing another way. So it flips the dipole of water through this, uh, this hydrogen bonding with these three. There, there are three specific residues that it binds in different uh, ways and then flips over. So that breaks the proton wire that allows protons to usually go through water columns. So this prevents protons from even going through. But this is overkill for desalination. We don't want to remove protons. But this, this uh, molecule actually does that. So now we want to use these kind of proteins in making membranes. That was my naive idea, right? During my PhD, I'll rip this protein out and make a membrane out of it. That was my naive idea. But we need to know some things about these proteins, because these are not regular soluble proteins. These are membrane proteins that sit in the membrane. So they have very unique properties, one of which is that it's very hydrophobic on the outside. So the surface, outer surface of this protein is very hydrophobic. So when you process these membranes, when you purify these proteins, if you just put them in water, they stick to each other and precipitate, right? It's too hydrophobic for that. The reason is you need it to be in a membrane. When it's in a membrane, uh, if you remember your uh, biology from high school, a lipid bilayer has a hydrophilic tail and a hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head, just like a detergent molecule, right? So that solvates the hydrophobic part and keeps it stable. 
So it needs this kind of hydrophobic cushion to survive. So when you purify this protein, you have to use detergents. You have to coat the hydrophobic part of the detergents, so then you can process it. Otherwise, it'll precipitate, and you won't be able to use it anymore. And when you want to reuse it again, you put it back into this kind of environment. The, the beauty of this is that once you put it in this environment, it orients itself. So it'll be a pore that goes through the membrane. So you don't have to worry about orienting it again, as some other membrane technologies you have to do. So that's one thing to know. Uh, the other thing to know is, I don't know how, few, how many of you uh, worked with lipids, but lipids are like oils, right? And oils, making membranes out of something that's squishy, doesn't make sense, right? You won't survive. It doesn't have any mechanical stability. So in my group, we started thinking about using block copolymers. Now, you can design block copolymers with hydrophobic and hydrophilic blocks. And if you design these right, you can make bilayers that look like lipid bilayers. And you can cross-link them to increase their stability. So that's why we said, we're not going to work with lipids. They're too unstable. We'll work with block copolymers. So that's the first realization I had during my PhD. And then, very quickly after that, we did this quick study where we put these uh, proteins. This is the bacterial aquaporin. So aquaporins are not only present in our bodies. They're present in microbes. They're present in plants. Uh, They're present in archaea. They're present in all kinds of forms of life. So the bacterial aquaporin is actually a very good uh, aquaporin. We put them in a block copolymer and we tried to measure its permeability, estimate its permeability from experiments. And this was during my PhD, and we showed that if this is an RO membrane and this is its permeability, it can be almost two orders of magnitude higher. And this, was a, this paper really created a lot of buzz uh, because this, this is a huge amount of water that you can make. And people got really excited, and I think there was a company that called me. When are you going to make this membrane? You want to commercialize it? And I was like, these guys are not reading my paper right. Because if you read my paper closely, I did my experiments with these things. If you look at the scale bar, it's about 100 nanometer. So these are 100 nanometer hollow spheres with, membrane, uh, with the hollow membranes with protein stuck in the wall. How are you going to make a membrane out of this that treats hundreds of millions of gallons of water, right? Nah. So I was like, what are you guys talking about? This is not ready for commercialization. Uh, but anyway, um, one of my colleagues in, uh, in uh, Singapore, uh, Singapore was, got really excited about this, and they started a funding uh, um, call in Singapore. And all my colleagues there <coughs> jumped on it. And they come, came up with a brilliant way around this. They said, OK, you can't make a membrane out of vesicles, but we can do something. So, they came up with this idea of taking these vesicles, they call them, with proteins in them, and putting them right into the reverse osmosis membrane. So I'm going to tell you, so this is how you make the polyamide layer on a reverse osmosis membrane. You put an aqueous monomer on top of the uh, porous support, and then you put an uh, organic uh, solvent compatible monomer on top. And at the interface, you make a membrane. So, what they did is they used this regular method to make membranes and just put these vesicles in there. Right? So they end up with a rejection layer, the polyamide layer, with these vesicles with aquaporins in them, and they can cast membranes. Now, this has become very popular. This uh, company that was formed after this thing was made has about $100 million in VC funding to commercialize this technology. So I was shocked because I was like, really? Because I have serious doubts about whether this is actually doing anything. And I don't know if you share my doubts or not, but if you look at this, this is a regular old RO membrane. And you have these vesicles in the middle. And then you have a regular old RO membrane. So there's high resistance here, low resistance here, high resistance here. How does this even work? And this protein, I told you, right, we have to baby it. We have to put in a detergent, put it in a lipid bilayer. How does it survive all this? I don't know, but $100 million. It's a big deal, right? So let's talk about some of the challenges that, that you could have with this kind of system, right? So it's been scaled up, and you can make it in large quantities. But I still think there are challenges to making aquaporin-type membranes, even though people came up with the shortcut. And uh, if you think about this, what do you guys think? What do you think is challenging about making membranes with this protein that I told you about? 
or even using this approach. Proteins lose activity. Protein lose activity, like stability issues, maybe. What else? Just withstanding high pressures. Withstanding high pressure, yeah. Another stability thing, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's challenges for sure. Uh, but stability, right? That's the biggest one. Does it even work, right? Does it even work for a long period of time? Um, so the so that's that's a practical thing that I still question. Uh, but the other thing that you can see is. When you make the membrane like they were making, the, the group was making and I demonstrated earlier, uh, you have only 500 to 1,000 proteins per micrometer squared. Right? This LPR is lipids to polymer ratio, or lipid to protein ratio. If you calculate the permeability of that, you get exactly the same value that you have for commercial membranes. So we should not see any improvement if you use those vesicles to make those membranes. So the, the fundamental calculation is just wrong to make those membranes. So, OK. And then making membranes with vesicles is just hard. Uh, there was a recent study that showed that only 4% uh, of the vesicles you add actually make it into the membrane. So this procedure has issues in addition to the big thing staring us in the face. How long do these proteins really last in this commercial system, right? Uh, so we'll address this later. I don't like talking about practical things. Let's talk about some of the intellectual things first. But I promise we'll talk about this too, eventually. Um, so how can we get around this? If we were to say that this idea will work, how can we pack more proteins in? So you can go back and look at nature. So when I was in, uh, uh, in my postdoc, I worked in a med medical school. We used to get shipments of sheep eyeballs because we were extracting uh, proteins, aquaporins from sheep eyeballs. So they used to just show up in the lab, used to dissect it and get it out of there. And if you take the sheep eyeball membrane and put it on an AFM surface, do you see these? Do you guys see this pattern? These are all aquaporins. So they are packed with aquaporins in a crystal, almost like a crystalline array. And this one, instead of uh, 500 to 1,000 uh, proteins per micrometer square, has 50,000. So if nature can make it, Perhaps we can pack it as well. And we do. So during my postdoc, we used to make these sheets of lipids. And this is the same square array that you saw in the last one. It's just a lower resolution. And you can make sheets that are about 5 microns by 5 microns in sh size with 50,000 uh, proteins per micrometer squared. So you can make these. Again, this is in lipids. And the reason we were doing it during my postdoc was to get structure using some methods. But this gave us the idea, why don't we make sheets instead of making vesicles? These sheets will have a nice shape instead of have being a vesicle. And they'll also have a very large concentration of proteins that we want. So, so we said, can we make this in polymers? Uh, so can we pack? So these are called two-dimensional crystals. Because if you put it in an uh, X-ray beam or electron beam, you actually get diffraction. So these are actual real two-dimensional crystals. So can we make them in block copolymers instead of making it in lipids, right? Because we want it to be a little more stable. Uh, so we tried. Uh, so before I get to that, I want to tell you how you actually make uh, lipid protein uh, combinations or polymer uh, membrane protein combinations so that it goes into the membrane, right? So I told you these membrane proteins have to be in detergent, otherwise they're not stable in water. We take the same detergent and put block copolymers in them so that it's dissolved. So these are my cells now. Then you mix them together to make mixed micelles. So it has detergent, polymer, protein in each micelle. Uh, and then if you remove detergent in a particular manner, in a slow, at a slow rate, and you have the ratio of polymer to protein right, you'll get rid of the detergent and it'll assemble into a very tightly packed membrane. So that was our hypothesis uh, of how you can make these two-dimensional crystals. So we tried that. We took this polybutadiene polyethylene oxide polymer which is a block copolymer we designed. And then if you don't have any protein, it makes this gyroid face. It makes all these worms. Uh, but when you start adding protein, you start making these vesicles. And then some larger sheets. And this one looks interesting. So we look closer. I don't know if you can see, but there is a pattern on here. Now you'll say, what are you doing? Are you trying to pull, pull wool over my eyes? Well, I don't see any pattern there, right? So the best test of anything that has a pattern is to do a Fourier transform of the image, right? Just like doing a diffraction, electron diffraction image. So if you do that, you see the square array, very sharp square.
square array. This means that it's organized. And if you take a picture of the island's arrays, it's exactly the same uh, unit cell. I don't know. Yeah, so it's a 65.5 angstrom tetragonal unit cell. So in polymers, we can make the same structure. So it's very highly packed. It's in a polymer. But again, this is only 100 nanometers. So it was a good paper. But again, 100 nanometers is too small. Uh, we want it to be at least micron size to make, make a membrane out of this. So the next thing we tried is to see if we can use a different protein, because aquaporins are alpha helical proteins that are not as stable as some other proteins, like a beta barrel protein that I'm going to show next. So we wanted to try it out to see what happens with another protein. Um, so this one makes, uh, so this protein is a trimer instead of a tetramer, and it has one nanometer holes. Uh, and it's present in the outer membrane of a bacterium, and uh, it's very stable. We've shown that you can put in chloroform and it survives, which is amazing for a protein, and it's also very mechanically stable. So we wanted to work with this protein, and it makes amazing crystals. So you guys can, in this one, you can see the pattern, right? So this, this packs proteins very easily at high density in a polymer. So that's, that's amazing to us. Um, and then, uh, we wanted to ask the question, this is a one nanometer hole, and most of my colleagues when I present some work ask me, can you do desalination? Because that's like the marquee separation of the age, you know? So we were like, okay, this is a one nanometer hole. A one nanometer hole cannot do desalination because salt is seven angstrom, uh, sodium and chloride about six, seven angstrom. They'll go right through, right? So this won't do desalination. The other question was, why stay with the permeability of an aquaporin. Can we go even faster than aquaporin? Why not, right? Well, while we are doing fun stuff, why don't we try that either? Try it also. So we read this one paper, and this was very eye-opening. So this guy is a biophysicist in, uh, in Austria, and he plotted all the hydrogen bonding residues. So in the channel, in the protein channels, uh, we have residues, amino acid residues that can hydrogen bond with water. So his question was, how does that relate to permeability or the diffusion of water inside? So he plotted the number of hydrogen bonding residues against the diffusion coefficient of water. And this is a log scale. So you can see that if you can eliminate hydrogen bonding within, within the channel, you can get much higher permeability. You can increase permeability by orders of magnitude. So that was our idea. So we were like, OK, maybe we redesign our protein so that we have only uh, hydrophobic amino acids that don't do hydrogen bonding, and make it even narrower so that it's not one nanometer. It's maybe a few angstrom. So we started um, a new initiative, we call it. We call it dial and angstrom initiative. So there's many meanings. One meaning is you call me, Manish, I want a 3.65 angstrom pore. Can you make it? And it's like, yes, I can make it. So we try to come up with a computational technique to take the scaffold of OMPF, the protein that we were working on, and uh, suggest mutations to it so that you can pack the central pore to a small size and make it all hydrophobic so that it's fast and it can maybe reject more things than just uh, one nanometer size. So, so we worked with, the, with a computational biologist and we wrote a program and it, it's actually published now. It's called Pore Designer, the name of the program. And we came up with about 30 different mutants of this OMPF protein, and we tested about four promising ones. So we wanted to show that you can really make the pore from one nanometer to four angstrom or three angstrom, because we thought that if you can get the pore to four angstrom, you can start rejecting salt, and I can make my colleagues very happy. Right? They love desalination. So, so this is the wild type. This is what you get from nature. Uh, this is aquaporin permeability. The units are, so this is about a billion water molecules per second. That's how I explain this permeability. Uh, so it's already a higher permeability because it's a bigger pore. Uh, and on the right axis, is it rejects things that are bigger than 600 Daltons. So 600 Daltons is a reasonable size molecule. Um, this second, the first mutant we made uh, is even higher permeability than the wild type, so certainly bigger than aquaporin. And it can reject sucrose, which is 360 Dalton. Uh, the next mutant we made, or we selected and then expressed, purified, and put in a membrane, um, can reject, uh, is even higher permeability, almost an order of magnitude higher, a eh, few times higher than this one. 
and it can reject glucose, which is 180 Dalton. And then we got really excited because the last one is good permeability and rejects salt. So we were very happy with this because now we can dial the size of the pore and get specific separation for different mutants. Uh, and these are challenging to make, but not that challenging. It's a, it's a stable protein. The purification is not as hard as some other membrane proteins. So this was good, but this was again done with those ves the vesicle system I showed you. That's our standard system to do scientific research on. Uh, so then people ask me, can you make a membrane? Can you make a membrane I can see without an electron microscope? Right, so, so we started doing this. So finally, in the last few years, we've been able to make membranes. Uh, so we do a very simple procedure. We take a support membrane, which is a poly cell phone, a polyether cell phone uh, with micron sized pores or 200 nanometer sized pores on them. We put a positively charged uh, polymer on that, which is very porous. Then we put these 2D sheets. This is carboxylate rich, the polybutadiene, the polymer, block copolymer. Uh, membrane I was using has carboxylates on it and it has proteins in it, so it's very highly uh, negatively charged. And we keep stacking till in a, uh, in a SEM, a scanning electron microscope, we don't see any holes going all the way through. And then we cross-link everything using this EDC, this is the aqueous cross-linking technique. And then we can make membranes that have, uh, this is with the wild type protein, which has about a 600 Dalton cutoff. So you know, I told you, right, the protein by itself has a 600 Dalton cutoff. So we can make a membrane that has a 600 Dalton cutoff because that's what the protein does. Uh, we could do some very nice separations with this. And uh, this is the proof that, that at 90% uh, rejection, the molecular weight cutoff is about 600. So you can make a membrane that's driven by the size of the protein that you use. So that's amazing because we designed a protein at the molecular level, and now we can make a membrane that we can actually hold in our hands. Uh, and I'll show you pictures uh, later on. So the comparison for this protein, uh, this membrane, is with other commercial membranes. So as you can see, this is about five liters per square meters per hour per bar, and this is about 300. So it's uh, almost 100 times higher, uh, because it is a very sharp cutoff, and it has a lot of pores per unit area. Uh, so at that point, so we were going to submit this paper. Uh, and my students are very worried about this kind of approach for me. And I'm like, can we do something else with this? Is this enough for a paper? And they were like, oh my god, what are we going to do now? Because what I thought at this point was, why, not, why stop with Ampef? We have all these other wonderful channels. Can we make membranes from these? Um, so this one is uh, also an outer membrane protein with the central plug. So it has a plug in the middle that we mutated out, so it's gone. So it makes a pore of 1.62 times 1.31, so an o oval pore. This is about 1 nanometer or 0.8 nanometer. And this one is a nice circular pore of 1.5 times 1.5. This you can buy on the market. You can buy it from Sigma. It sell they sell it as a powder, this protein. Uh, but it is also a membrane protein, but much more stable. So we wanted to see if we can make membranes out of all these different uh, membrane proteins, uh, because why stop at one? And you can ask me a question based on this. Maybe you can think about that now. Why don't we go in this direction? Why don't we make it smaller in this direction? But anyway, so this was a great success. This paper is currently in review. Hopefully it'll come out. Um, so this is OMPEF. I told you it's about, uh, about 600, 400, 500, 600, that, that range, uh, cut off, uh, high water permeability. Uh, this is FUE, it's even higher. Oh, that's the permeability. Okay, so this is uh, uh, this is the permeability, and this is the cutoff. And these are commercial membranes. This is the permeability, and that's the cutoff. So cutoff means it can reject things larger than a thousand Dalton. Um, so we can make pro uh, protein membranes in this range that are amazingly high permeability compared to what's out there, and they have a very sharp cutoff of between 600, uh, 500, and 1,000 Dalton. Uh, the reason this is good is there's nothing on the market that comes close, right? So if you look at, this is all, these are all the proteins, uh, these are all the membranes on the market that do molecular weight cutoff 200 to 1,200 separations. And that's their high limit right here, about uh, 10, 12 LMH per bar. We can make membranes that can go up to 2,100 LMH per bar just because of the high packing density 
single uniform pore size uh, and uh, very hydrophobic interior. So this is, this is a, I think for us, it's a, it's a big achievement because I've been promising these kind of membranes since my first paper in 2007. So we can finally make these membranes. Um, so I'm very happy about that. So yeah, many, many times higher. So we're very happy about that. So all this was a good science story, right? We came up with a challenge, we solved the challenge. Still, this is made with these very expensive proteins. And again, the question is still there. Did we solve the stability problem? Maybe, maybe not, right? Because it's still protein-based. Uh, and these membrane proteins are hard to make. So except for the one that we can buy, the alpha hemolysin, when we make it in the lab, it costs about $200 for a milligram. Not a gram, a milligram. So it's expensive. Maybe it has applications in certain areas, but it's hard to convince environmental engineers that this is going to do any good, right? So my student, who was an environmental engineer by training, in 2014 said, Manisha, I'm sick of this stuff. I can't sell this stuff to people. This is just all science and no action. So he's like, let's, let's do something interesting. Let's try to see if we can make artificial membrane proteins. We learned all this stuff from designing membrane proteins. Can we design uh, artificial channels? Can we design stuff in the lab, use synthetic chemistry to make them that, has, that we can pack at high density, just like in proteins? Uh, is flat instead of being vesicles, has no hydrogen bonding with water. So we learned all this thing from biology. Now let's try, try to use it uh, using synthetic chemistry. So that was his idea. So we did a, a survey. So there, were all, there was already in 2012 uh, a new field emerging called artificial water channels. And uh, they, they used to make these cyclic molecules and put them in lipid bilayers and do structure, structural studies. And if they found water inside, they call it water channels. And they said, this could be good desalination membranes because they pass water. So that's what they were, people were saying at that time because these were all chemistry studies. All of these were in chemistry journals. So we emailed all of them and we said, you know, we know how to measure water transport. Can you send it to us so we can measure your water transport and then you'll know whether it is actually a water channel? Nobody, not how many people got back. This person is actually very famous. But these two people got back to us, so we started measuring them. So let's talk about this one today, these macro cycles. No, no, the pillarine, this one. This one is like a, a tube. Um, and uh, we wanted to focus on that one because that looked promising to us. So these are the questions we had when we were talking to these people. Um, can we improve artificial channel water permeability? So the first generation channels that we worked on uh, they had five orders of magnitude lower permeability than aquaporins. So if you put these in a membrane, the matrix of the membrane will have higher permeability than the channel. So these are no water channels because they don't improve water permeability, but they do have water in the structure. So there's some promise there. And the second one is always, can we make membranes out of them, right? So, so those are two questions we wanted to work on. Uh, so we selected this channel. Uh, this channel was made by Jun Li Hu in Fudan University. And, um, now we make it in our lab. So it has a unique structure. So the central ring is a dihydroxybenzene, right? So this is OH, OH over here. And then you make a ring of it. You make five of them in a circle. So you end up with a five angstrom hole in the middle. And then on here, you graft these hydrophobic peptide chains. So this is phenylalanine, which is a very hydrophobic amino acid and uh, DLD phenylalanine followed by carboxylate. And then these hydrogen bond with each other. So it, you, it makes almost a solid tube that you can put inside a membrane. Um, so we did all kinds of studies with this and the details we can talk about if you want. Uh, but we found that this is the first channel that approached that billions of water molecules per channel per second that aquaporins do. So this was quite exciting. Uh, we were able to show that you can make an artificial channel that does that. But there were other things we learned from it. We learned that there's single file transport, right? This is a hallmark of efficient water transport. If you can make a channel that does single file transport, uh, it also aggregates in lipid bilayer, bilayer. So I'll explain to you why that's important. And then from simulation, we can show that it has similar values to 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 um, uh, to what we measured. So I don't know if this video will work, but. Oh, both of them work. Maybe not. So if you see this uh, uh, 
So how much time do we have? Till five or? Okay, yeah. So you can see that this is single file transport here, right? And this is an aquaporin simulation. It's very similar to that. Uh, that's important for many biophysicists to believe that it's actually that high, the permeability. Uh, the second one, uh, second point I wanted to make is um, we were close, we were half a billion water molecules per second while aquaporins is four. But one thing to remember is that I showed you that picture of the tetramer, right? And I showed you the space filling version. So if you notice closely, the protein was big, but the hole was small, right? So if the protein is big and the hole is small, you're wasting a lot of area, right? So if you divide the actual area of the protein with how much water you're passing through, they're all about the same. So this was a trick to get the reviewers to say, oh yeah, yeah, this is an impressive channel. But this is an important point. You have to have good, usable cross-sectional area. That's why proteins are not as good as artificial channels when you try to make membranes. Um, this is a video where we try to see if these, pro these channels aggregate. And if I run this video, which we don't have time for, they start sticking with each other. So our simulation colleagues were quite worried. They were like, why are these proteins sticking with each other? Uh, these channels, they might not be working. But I was quite excited because, as you know, I like to pack proteins in membranes to make 2D crystals, right? So this gave me a clue that maybe it can do that. These ch artificial channels may also make 2D crystals. So we did that, right? So can we pack a lot of these channels to form sheets instead of vesicles? We did the exact same study that I've done before, put more and more channels, and we, we can make some sheets, we think. And the, the, the proof is in the Fourier transform where we find a hexagonal pattern, diffraction pattern. So that shows that this actually makes a 2D crystal with this artificial channel. Um, and what that means is it looks like this. It looks like it has a hexagonal array of channels with each one transporting water. So it's very high density uh, membranes. So yeah, so we are very happy because the pore density is uh, two orders of magnitude higher than anything else that's out there. So it has great potential. Uh, again, we wanted to make membranes, so I went back and did my thing. I, we put it in block copolymers. Uh, instead of making um, two-dimensional crystals, it makes this phase-separated domains. If you look closer, all this white stuff is this channel aggregated in there. So we still have very high pore density. And then we use the same technique that I showed you before, this layer by layer technique. Uh, this is the support with holes in it. And then we keep layering crystals on them till we get complete coverage. And again, this one gives us about a 500 Dalton cutoff um, membrane. And again, this is better than many other uh, commercial membranes on the market. It's not as great as the Ampef membrane, but it is completely artificial, right? It has no proteins in them. It has a very similar performance. So I'm going to stop here because I want to take questions. Um, and then uh, we can discuss more about what else can be done with this. And uh, that's, that's all I want to talk about today. All right. Talking about the water channels, you said you went to these larger water channels. Yes. Why didn't you try to find smaller water channels? Yeah, so we do have, and I have it in here, so we do have smaller water channels, uh, and this is a, another paper that's in review that does perfect desalination, uh, but making a membrane. So when we make these layer by layer membranes, uh, we cannot seal it so that the matrix itself doesn't leak salt, right? So we can seal it up to 180 Dalton. We haven't come up with a way to seal the matrix that it doesn't leak salt. So that's where we are stuck. We have channels now that can reject salt much better than any other channels out there. And it has an even higher permeability than this PAP5 channel. And maybe I'll skip to that just to show you. And this is a unique, uh, so this is where it lies. So this is the permeability tr selectivity trade-off curve that I was talking about earlier, right? More permeability, less selectivity. This is where all the D-cell membranes are. But this new channel, we are almost three orders of magnitude, almost six orders of magnitude higher in terms of what selectivity it can provide. So we have a desalination channel. I just can't make a membrane out of it because I don't know how to seal the membrane. So I can seal a membrane up to 
rejecting sucrose or glucose, but after that, I'm not a good enough engineer to seal it so that we can reject salt. But we do have a channel that can do this at very high rates. Uh, but it'll probably take another 10 years, but we'll get there. So, <laughs> so yeah. Does the water go through these channels as single water molecules, or does it go through as aggregates? Yeah, so very good question, and that goes to this. Uh, so in, the, in all that I've shown you today, right, uh, all of them were single file water transport, right? Uh, because single file water transport is important because it prevents, so water when it goes through as a cluster, it has, uh, it is bigger, right? Because it is hydrogen bonded to four, five, six other waters. When it goes through as a single file, it's only hydrogen bonded to two. And that helps in the fast transport through the channel. But in this latest channel that I uh, worked on, what we have done is when these channels come together, oh, where can I show this? It makes this network so that water can percolate through this network. Um, let's see if this video works. So this, the, this is about 22 channels that are aggregated together. So instead of one water wire per channel, two of them come together and you can have four water wires going through two channels because there are many paths going through. So it's still single file water transport but it's not one channel, one wire. It's four wires, one channel. So you can increase permeability that way. So this is our latest channel. But in general, you want single file transport, but you want more wi wires per unit area to increase the permeability. So, so that's, that's what we are just finishing up and trying to publish, I guess I'll just go here. Yeah, so. Yeah, so single file is what we want, but maybe there's even better ways of doing this. So, other questions? I'll ask you. Yeah. So, um, so where do you think this is going? Like, where are we going to be in, mm -hmm. let's even say, like, 50 years with desalination? Are we going to be seeing artificial water channels? Oh, I think, I think it's very possible. Uh, because these are doable. Um, we are trying to come up with platforms that are simpler to make in terms of, so we've learned a lot by doing these very fundamental studies, uh, but we are trying to go to platforms that use, say, interfacial polymerization to make these kind of membranes. Um, so they should be much more permeable, uh, and you've heard the discussion on permeability, right? Uh, so if we can solve some problems with highly permeable membranes, uh, these could have very good applications in desalination, and if not in desalination, other applications where we can have a little more expensive membrane uh, to do the same thing. So where I really think the, the advantage of these kind of uh, membranes is since it's so selective, you can make different size channels. You can have, say, urea separation from sugar, uh, or you can have many process, you can even have uh, in uh, 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 distillation, you separate uh, um, say C4s, so you separate isobutane from butane, or you separate ethane from ethylene, and those are billion dollar separations. So if you have channels like these, you can actually those, do those kind of separations much more efficiently, and those are, those are higher value products than salt and water. So, but I think it's possible that we can go to that kind of, um, uh, that kind of uh, paradigm for separations. So instead of doing solution diffusion. Yeah. So how thick, and you talked about the, the real biological membrane yeah. that does this well, it was very thin. Very thin. How thick are these artificial? Yeah, so we always stick with the same dimension. So each layer that we make is four nanometer. Four nanometer. Uh, the, my ideal membrane, if I could design it that way, is you take a porous support and four nanometer on it. But engineering doesn't allow me to do that because there are always defects. That's why we keep layering things till all the defects disappear. So we end up with a 100 nanometer membrane also. So, <laughs> so if we can find a better manufacturing method, I would like it to be like 10, 10 nanometer. So, so how, does, how do the organisms mm -hmm. do it so much better? So the organisms do it better because they're self-assembled and they're squishy. Right? So they don't do separation on our skin. We have a very tough skin, right? But this doesn't do any molecular separations. 
when you get to the cell, the cell is quite squishy. Uh, like mammalian cells, you can easily break. But it's protected by all this till you reach where you need to do that separation. That's how they do it. We are kind of doing it in reverse. We have our active layer facing the water. So you, it has to withstand that kind of pressure. But maybe there's something there. I, I, haven't, I haven't figured out how to make it tough and keep it just one layer, right? And then they do, do it by using cells, and they seal the cells with each other really well. And we can't do that right now. We don't know how to take two vesicles and seal them so that there's no gap in between. So those are tough things to, to solve. So we are still taking shortcuts, so, yeah. Yes. So that that pile extreme, if it's coming out of the cracker, it's usually pretty hot. Pretty hot. Like really hot. Really hot, yes. So yeah, so I'm not saying we're gonna use this technique. We have a different uh, so we use these principles of having yeah. But so do you think we can make these really stable? Uh, so the technique that I'm using uses a, a, a more robust uh, a processing technique. We don't use these channels and block copolymers. We use an interfacial polymerization technique. So what we use there is this molecular recognition and size principle. So it's an, a real, little bit of an extension of this idea. Um, because now we know what sizes we need and we can get them uh, perfectly. Uh, when we actually make the, those are actually commercial uh, grade membranes that we can make. Um, so we still haven't proven that it does a very, really good job, but preliminary results show that it kind of works. And, uh, and the temperature is a factor, but with those materials that we are using, it actually works OK. So yeah. So what temperature, though? 200? So, uh, I mean, so it fits a screen coming out of an ethane cracker. Uh -huh. Several hundred. Yeah, so I think, we, I think we can do that, or get close to it. So. Yeah. But this, this one will, won't last. It's a different architecture. So we can, we can talk more. I can tell you more about it. So, yeah. Other questions? I left time for questions. I could have bombarded with you more fancy stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know if they ex explained to you some of the metal cleanup, the another problem we talked about here. Yeah. Are your membranes potentially useful for that? Because yeah. These are more complicated mixtures. It's not just taking salt out. Yeah. Or cracking, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, so the concept could work. Um, I don't know if any of these have the stability to handle uh, complex strains. Um, but the idea of using what, what I just said for uh, cracking, it's the same type of thinking. If we can make the selective element of a membrane perfectly match with what you want to remove, then you can use this kind of concept. Uh, so we are trying to design a membrane that does lithium separations. So it allows lithium to go through much better than sodium or magnesium or potassium. So we are using very similar principles to make that kind of membrane. And those are going to be robust membranes. So relatively useful for the kinds of separation that you use for re resource recovery, perhaps from the mixtures that we have here. Right. I mean, I mean, so around here, we've got copper, which there's a market for. We've got molybdenum, which there's a market for. We've got arsenic, that there may not be quite so much market. But you want to get rid of it somehow. Right, you want to get rid of it. And, and yeah. so Yeah, so, so we are working towards that. But like I said, most of my work is so conceptual. It takes forever to get to a product. Uh, but the ideas that we are working on for that, that, those kind of streams are relatively close to application. So we are trying to raise funding and trying to see if we can uh, make some things quicker. Uh, uh, UT just invested in a pilot casting line. So you actually can make modules in the university. Uh, so we are hoping to, to try to do these things so that they are commercial a little faster than most of the other work that I do. So 
So it's, it's definitely doable, and this concept works for that, because you're doing selective separations. And you can control it by size and functionality. You can make the pores by size and functionality. So, so perhaps we have a chance. But all these things take time, but it's a fun journey. So, yeah. Other questions? All right, thank you.